get started, I'm going to do some introductory stuff while we're waiting for the last few people to trickle in from the lunch line. Uh, welcome to another week of the Behavior, Evolution, and Culture Speaker Series. We meet every Monday of the academic year at this time in this room. Um, a list for all the speakers, past and present, can be found on our website, which is at beck.ucla.edu. We only have a few speakers left this year, and I'll preview a couple of them in just a moment. Um, and um, let's see, there's a sign-in sheet going around. If you haven't signed it already, please do. That helps our sponsors keep track of um, how many of us are here each week. And um, OK, before I introduce today's speaker, I'm just going to um, briefly give you an update on who's coming in next. So next week, um, our own Brian Wood is going to be talking. And the title of his talk is Pods of Hunter-Gatherers, Movement Ecology, and the Sexual Division of Labor. And the following week, uh, May 20th, um, Courtney Meehan will be here from Washington State University, and her talk will be entitled The Social World, World of Indian Moms and Microbes. So that's what's coming up the next couple of weeks. I'm um, very happy to introduce Lee Gettler, who's here from, um, from Notre Dame, and is going to be talking to us about the biology of fatherhood. Welcome. All right, thank you, Brooke. Uh, thanks to the Department of Anthropology and the speaker series for inviting me out and thank uh, you all for being here. I'm excited to talk to you a bit about the, the work I'm doing on the biology of fatherhood in, in different uh, cultural contexts around the world. There we go. Uh, so the starting point for talking about uh, the biology of fatherhood or really invested fatherhood in the uh, human lineage from an evolutionary perspective uh, is kind of the unique components that make up human life history. I'm assuming most of you are probably familiar with this, but our babies are born very vulnerable. They take a long time to grow up. They mature, kind of achieve independence well into their second decade of life. And as a consequence, uh, they're very costly in terms of time and energy, and yet we stack those dependents on top of one another. Um, and nonetheless, our offspring survive at much higher rates to adulthood than when you compare us to our closest relative, the great apes. So from a life history theory perspective, uh, you wouldn't expect necessarily this suite of characteristics to evolve in a single species. Um, in particular, there should be some trade-offs, uh, either for mothers, if we're talking about mammals, given that mothers are usually the, the sole kind of caregiver for offspring. Um, there may also be, of course, some trade-offs that could occur um, for the young who are uh, kind of living under this uh, life history regime in terms of uh, growing up with other dependent offspring, uh, their siblings kind of concurrently. So there should be trade-offs. How do we get here? Um, the, the consensus is that we're cooperative caregivers and that over the course of our evolutionary history, uh, mothers were cooperating with uh, a number of different uh, kind of individuals um, in their communities and in their families, including their own older children, uh, grandmothers and other female kin, um, in terms of thinking about uh, foragers and kind of pooled energy budgets, um, there's kind of increasing evidence that uh, adults without young kids help to kind of buffer uh, families with those young expensive children. And then of course the idea that fathers uh, were evolutionarily important to this uh, evolution of human life history has been around in anthropology for decades. If we step back, think about humans in comparative context and think about what fathers do or do not do in our species versus our closest relatives, the great apes, um, what we see is that in none of the great apes do fathers invest in their young in the uh, costly, consistent, and diverse ways that fathers on average do across human societies. Uh, one of my good friends uh, and collaborator, Stacy Rosenbaum, has done some really important um, and influential work over the last couple of years showing that gorilla uh, fathers actually, or males in particular, do uh, interact positively with young, but that's a fairly low cost form of interaction. Uh, I definitely would suggest checking out um, Stacy's work. But comparing that, what gorillas are doing, to what fathers do on average across human societies, this kind of paternal investment in our lineage is, is much more costly and, and time intensive. So that tells us that this kind of tendency to invest heavily in our children uh, among human fathers, that this may be a behavioral predisposition um, that is a derived trait in our lineage, doesn't tell us much about what fathers might have been doing evolutionarily 
and we're pretty constrained in terms of thinking about uh, what or what lines of evidence we can bring to bear on that question. Uh, there's general consensus, I think, in uh, the biological anthro and evolutionary anthro communities that uh, fathers provisioning and fathers uh, calories that they, they bring into uh, both their family and the community overall um, was important to our capacity to kind of ev evolve this uh, specific life history strategy that I just described a few slides ago. Um, most of you are probably familiar with that because you have Brian Wood here who's made some important contributions uh, to those conversations. Beyond that, um, anthropologists don't necessarily talk about a lot of uh, other kind of contributions that fathers might make um, to benefiting their young. And I've always been interested in the potential role of fathers as direct caregivers in the course of human evolution. Um, fathers. Uh, spending time with their children, carrying them, uh, watching over them, playing with them. These are things that could potentially benefit them in terms of their developmental trajectories and their quality, and for some types of behaviors, um, even increase uh, offspring survival over the course of human evolution. But the challenge is, uh, none of those behaviors uh, leave an indelible mark in the archaeological or the fossil record. Um, this is where I like to interject my own dad joke about us ha having not found the Homo erectus baby Bjorn yet in the archaeological <laughs> record. Um, but the larger point here um, is that if you're interested in these kind of questions about what fathers may have been doing evolutionarily and particularly in terms of spending time with their children in direct care or in proximity to them, um, we're fairly limited in the lines of evidence available to us. And so what folks, uh, what myself and other folks in our discipline like Peter Gray have argued is that uh, we can look at contemporary male biology for signatures of these kind of direct care behaviors. How are they? Uh, mediated by physiological mechanisms, um, how do kind of interactions with children um, affect the biological pathways that maybe help mediate life history trade-offs, uh, and that can give us uh, some sense of what types of fathering behaviors may have been important evolutionarily with selection poten potentially acting um, on these physiological mediators. The basis for uh, that kind of perspective is really grounded um, in a two-tiered approach. One is that uh, across vertebrates, biparental care uh, and pair bonding has evolved independently multiple times, um, including in a handful of mammalian lineages. And then in addition to that, um, across vertebrate taxa, there's a number of conserved neuroendocrine axes that we share with other taxa, like birds, where father uh, investment is much more common than it is in mammals. Um, and when biparental care evolves in those other lineages, selection tends to kind of co-opt the same physiological pathways to help uh, promote that type of uh, invested care. And in particular, kind of glossing over, this is the 40,000 foot view here, but uh, glossing over the, the kind of basic details to get to these overarching patterns, essentially there are three neuroendocrine axes that are kind of commonly co-opted to help promote paternal care or pair bonding across vertebrate species, um, testosterone, prolactin, and oxytocin. And so when you look particularly in mammalian species, uh, when fathers are in the kind of period where they're cooperating with mothers to help raise young, um, they oftentimes have some combination of lower testosterone and higher prolactin and higher oxytocin. Um, and so in general across mammals, uh, that kind of sweet, uh, that physiological profile and suite of uh, hormonal um, functions, tends to promote cooperation, um, and in species like humans, um, it seems to help promote uh, paternal nurturance and direct caregiving. Um, today I'm going to talk to you a bit about, a lot about testosterone, a little bit about oxytocin, and I have some data about prolactin that I'd be happy to chat about kind of um, in the Q&A if you want, but it's uh, not necessarily included in the, the talk. But again, coming back to kind of a, a very uh, 40,000 foot perspective on this, uh, jumping to kind of maybe deliver the overarching punchline of what you see in humans is that across uh, studies of human fathering, you tend to find that um, when men have lower testosterone, higher prolactin, and higher oxytocin, they tend to be more involved um, with direct caregiving and nurturance, particularly um, of young kids. Now, part of the reason I'm talking about this right now is because I'm going to highlight some of the work. 
um, that my colleagues and I are doing cross-culturally that really suggests that part of the reason that you see this specific suite of uh, hormones associated with father's direct caregiving is because it's being studied, or to date, this has really only been studied in cultural contexts where this kind of fathering is valued. And in fact, there's uh, quite a bit of flexibility uh, potentially in what kinds of biological profiles are associated with invested fathering when we think in a more diverse way about what human fathering uh, entails in different cultural contexts and ecologies. So going back about 10 or 15 years ago, uh, kind of before my colleagues and I started working on these questions, um, we had some indicators that uh, married uh, fathers in specific cultural contexts tended to have lower uh, testosterone than single non-fathers. Peter Gray did a lot of um, the kind of foundational work on this, looking at these questions of life history status uh, and testosterone in different cultural and ecological contexts around the world. Um, and there was some other work that suggested that uh, fathers with lower testosterone, if you brought them to a lab and exposed them to recorded infant cries, they would express kind of more sympathy and need to respond. Uh, and there was some hints from our field that fathers with lower testosterone um, might be more inclined to paternal care, uh, including some work by Martin Muller and colleagues, which I'll return to a little bit later. Uh, I've been fortunate to be able to explore these questions in the context of a long-running, large longitudinal birth cohort study in the Philippines. Uh, the Cebu Longitudinal Health and Nutrition Survey. Uh, the study's conducted in Cebu. Uh, Metropolitan Cebu is the second largest urban center in the Philippines behind Manila. Uh, it's located in the central Visayas region. Uh, because the study was designed as a representative sample of all the births in 1983 and 84 in Metropolitan Cebu, um, it's a very diverse study uh, in terms of um, social class, household ecology, uh, things of that nature. So we're getting um, uh, a particularly kind of a range of uh, family experiences and environments kind of represented in the study. And the study was started in 83 and 84, enrolling around 3,300 pregnant women um, who were then, uh, they and their infants were then followed up at multiple time points um, across the early 80s and into the 90s. Um, and I'm working with or presenting data uh, and working with the men uh, who were born in the early 80s and who are now adults. And I'm going to show you some data from when they were around 21 years old and again when they were 26. <coughs> so that prior work that I alluded to, particularly by uh, Peter Gray, uh, was really foundational uh, to people beginning to ask these questions about how fatherhood might interrelate with men's biology, um, but had the limitation of being um, cross-sectional, and so the longitudinal component of the Cebu study is a huge asset in be, being able to kind of an, untangle whether lower testosterone men are more li likely to become partnered fathers, or whether the transition to partnered fatherhood coincides with a decline in testosterone. In addition to that kind of longitudinal uh, strength, uh, Cebu is also right now particularly a, a particularly good place to study uh, questions about variability in fathering. If you're interested in how, say, variation in time you spend with your children or time you spend in direct care might be related to biological variability, which of course is, uh, again, as I said, is something that uh, was of, of particular interest to me. And so what you see, these are data um, from 2009 when the men were 26, but quite a few of the men are spending a fair amount of time in proximity to kind of watching over their kids as well as in, in kind of hands-on direct caregiving with them. Um, the, the way that this is phrased in Cebuano um, is inclusive of kind of being in the same room as your child and being available to them. If these men, if 31% of the men were doing three hours a day of childcare, they would be the world's most involved dads by far, probably by uh, two times over or something compared to say the Barry Hewitt's uh, work with the ACA. Um, but nonetheless, what we see is we get this range of variation in what fathers are doing. Um, and so we're able to kind of map that onto how their uh, biology varies in this context. So to get at this question of whether life history transitions are related to changes in testosterone, um, ideally you would want to start with a group of men who have experienced neither marriage or partnering. Um, or fatherhood, and so we were able to start with a group of men who, uh, of 465 men um, when they were 21 who had not yet um, had kids or been in a 
cohabiting or kind of legally uh, married relationship. We collected saliva samples from them um, during in-home interviews. Um, and in the context of the, the slides I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to refer to partnered men, and those are men who are married or, or cohabiting. And then fathers are men who have at least one biological child. So the first slide I'm going to show you here um, is going to show men's waking testosterone and their evening testosterone at these two time points. And it's stratified by whether men were neither single nor fathers. So that's the neither neither group. Those are the single non-fathers. Um, whether men had become newly partnered but not fathers, or whether men had become newly partnered new fathers um, by the time they were 26. So again, we're talking about a four and a half uh, year time period between these two data collections. And I will show this to you um, a bit more effectively um, in the subsequent slides. But what you can see is that overall there's kind of a trajectory where men's testosterone is going down in all three of those groups. But uh, on this slide, I particularly want to orient you to the fact that there was this prevailing question about whether men with lower testosterone might be the ones who are more inclined to become partnered fathers. Um, in Cebu, it's actually the opposite of that, um, particularly for their waking testosterone. It's men with higher testosterone in the morning who are at age 21 who are more likely to be partnered fathers by the time they're 26. Okay, so men with higher testosterone when they're 21 are more likely to become partnered fathers, which then puts them into position to potentially experience this decline in testosterone. So if we look across those three categories, um, the percentage change for single non-fathers is actually fairly uh, minor. The men who become newly partnered non-fathers are intermediate between these two other groups, and then men who become newly partnered new fathers experience around a 25% decline in their testosterone on average. So again, these are men uh, in their mid-20s, in theory, in their reproductive prime. And that decline in testosterone of about 25% is the equivalent of about a decade of aging in longitudinal studies of men's changes in testosterone over time in the United States. So it's quite a biologically meaningful change on average. We scale this out based on how old men's youngest child was um, when we got to them um, during our sampling in 2006, or I'm sorry, 2009. What we see is the men who had newborns at home um, experienced an even larger decline in testosterone, um, upwards of 42%. And then it scales out in kind of a J-shaped curve where looking across men, the men who had um, children who kind of moved into that older toddler stage by the time we were sampling them in uh, 2009, um, their testosterone had not come back to where it was before they became fathers, um, but it had started to rebound a bit um, for these men in their 20s. If we look, so among those men who were newly partnered new fathers at age 26, uh, some of them only had one child and some of them had already had multiple children in that four and a half year window. And if we look at their kind of average changes in testosterone, um, what you see is that there's a, a fairly equivalent uh, pattern in terms of uh, how dramatically their testosterone is coming down. The next question that we wanted to explore is whether uh, men with lower testosterone were more involved with childcare, so these data are going to be correlational. But coming back to the, uh, the graph on the left uses those same categories as I showed you earlier. Um, what you can see is that men who are spending the most time with their children um, have significantly lower testosterone than men who are spending very little time with their children. And then the two categories in between are kind of intermediate. Um, on the right, uh, Cebu is a context in which uh, families share sleeping surfaces, and so they're co-sleeping um, as the kind of cultural norm. And what you can see is that fathers on the far right there who are sharing a sleeping surface with their children have significantly lower testosterone than men um, who are doing what's more normative, say, in the United States and putting their babies to sleep um, in rooms by themselves or their children in rooms by themselves. Um, and this is independent of what they're doing during the day. So there seems to be um, a relationship between men's daytime childcare uh, and their testosterone as well as the sleep proximity that they have um, relative to their families at nighttime. And so one possibility here is that <coughs> men are transitioning to invested fatherhood. Um, some aspect of that transition to fatherhood causes their testosterone to go down and then men who have lower testosterone then get more involved with childcare. 
Uh, and there's been some uh, longitudinal work since we published these data that are generally consistent with that. Um, Robin Edelstein and Darby Saxby uh, are folks who work on a small but really well-designed longitudinal study um, working with families in Michigan. And they've shown that uh, uh, men who are expectant fathers, so tracking men's testosterone through their partner's pregnancies, that the more men's testosterone comes down across their partner's pregnancies, the more involved fathers are uh, in the postpartum in terms of taking care of their, their babies. Um, and actually that decline in testosterone across their partner's pregnancies also predicts how um, satisfied and supported their, their partners feel um, by, by the fathers. Uh, we um, just wrapped up a study relatively recently in South Bend, Indiana. Um, my former postdoc, Patty Klo, is the lead author on this article. We collected samples from men on the day their babies were born and the day after their babies were born, and then interviewed or had them fill out surveys um, on their relationship with their, their, their babies, their psychosocial stress, and kind of what they were doing in terms of parental involvement a few months later. Um, and the fathers who have lower testosterone on the day after their babies are born um, are more involved with uh, a number of different kinds of uh, child care tasks, both kind of the changing of diapers and uh, bathing of children and the things you have to do with uh, young infants, as well as kind of more indirect behaviors like arranging for child care and things, going to the grocery store for diapers and things like that. Um, and so these are both uh, consistent with the idea that kind of Testosterone is potentially starting to change uh, during men's partners' pregnancies, but that the decline in testosterone is then predictive of what men are doing later. Uh, there's also an alternative possibility that some men transition to fatherhood, um, have inclinations to become more involved with childcare, um, and then that causes their testosterone to go down. Um, and there have not been uh, kind of specific lag designs to try to, to suss out these two. But I've always argued that I think there's probably a feedback loop between the two, that lower testosterone perhaps inclines men to be more involved in childcare, and then if men are more involved in childcare, um, that feeds back to their testosterone staying low. And we were able to use longitudinal data from the Cebu study, so going to the men, rather than starting with the men who are single non-fathers when they're 21, we, we looked at the men who are already fathers when they were 21, and then we looked at how much childcare they were doing when they're 21 and 26. And if men increased, if fathers increased their child care between those two time points, their testosterone went down. If they decreased their child care um, between those two time points, their testosterone went up. And then again, with a fairly meaningful effect size. Um, I'm not going to, to get into a lot of the details of the different kind of um, cultural context and study designs that have been employed to try to study this um, in settings around the world, but this overarching finding of t father's testosterone being lower and then being more involved with childcare has been uh, found in, in various sites around the world. And I'm kind of flagging this study, particularly by Martin Moeller and colleagues, um, because it, it provides, I think, some useful and important um, foundational findings about the way that this may vary by socio-ecological context. And so what um, Martin and his colleagues did is they looked at testosterone and parenting status among the Datoga, who are pastoralists um, in Tanzania. And what they found is that uh, fathers and non-fathers basically look functionally equivalent for testosterone in, that, in this cultural context. In this setting, fathers' primary roles in terms of, say, investing in their families um, involves kind of dedication to um, pastoralist activities, being with the herd, and fathers are not spending a lot of time or, or very, really any time at all, as far as I understand it, with kind of young children. Um, and it's maybe not until the children are much older and are able to help with some of those herding animals that fathers maybe are starting to interact with kids, routinely anyway. Um, and then among the Hadza, what you find is that fathers have significantly lower testosterone than non-fathers. And Hadza fathers, when they are in camp, will spend time holding children, watching over them, they co-sleep with them. And so there is uh, much more uh, exposure for Hadza fathers and involvement um, for Hadza fathers in terms of interacting um, with babies and young children. And so building from that kind of work as well as some of the work that uh, Peter Gray did um, with a few different polygynous societies in Kenya, uh, my colleagues and I, um, Adam Boyette and I particularly, um, designed a study 
um, to look at inter and intracultural diversity and fathering in two small scale societies in the Republic of the Congo. Um, so we were really interested in looking at how models of fathering and family life differed between um, a fisher farmer agriculturalist society and then a neighboring um, foraging society. And we were particularly interested in whether this translated to differences in men's psychobiology um, and how fathers influence child health and well-being in these two settings. Um, I'm going to talk to you um, particularly today about the, our data from the Bandongo Fisher Farmers. Um, so they are Sweden agriculturalists and they primarily um, subsist on those agricultural products as well as um, proteins from fishing. Um, ethnographically, I'm going to kind of point to a few um, components of their societal uh, setup that are particularly relevant to the, the biological um, outcomes that I'll show you, but they are um, a fairly hierarchical society. They have a social hierarchy based on gender, age, and acquired status. Uh, men's subsistence roles um, primarily uh, focus around um, clearing forest growth for the garden plots and then uh, women do all of the gardening um, and planting and kind of cultivation. Uh, men um, are, pri are the, primarily the, the fisher uh, men in this um, community and then men play an important role in terms of cultivating palm wine. And so these subsistence roles, one, are often risky, um, felling the forest growth, um, burning the forest growth, um, fishing along the river, um, often involves um, risks of drowning as well as potentially attacks by animals like crocodiles. Um, and then in addition to that, scaling these tall trees to cultivate palm wine is particularly uh, risky and men um, often um, fall and are injured by doing this. But all these activities, particularly the cultivation of palm wine, palm wine are ways in which they acquire status within the community. Okay, so um, both those kind of risk-taking behaviors as well as pursuit of status um, within social hierarchies are things that tend to be related to higher testosterone, not lower testosterone. Uh, to, to kind of initially get at what the internal cultural models of, of fatherhood were, um, Shana, Lou Levy, and, and Adam Boyette um, con conducted ethnographic interviews with Bondogo adult men and women. Um, and really tried to understand what are the roles that are valued for fathers in the community and how, how do the Bandongo uh, perceive that fathers influence children's health. Um, from these interviews, um, there were some common uh, themes that emerged in terms of what fathers' um, roles are and which of them are valued. Um, in particular, fathers' provisioning, um, providing resources, working hard for their family um, is the most culturally valued component of what fathers are seen to do for families and to improve child health. Um, in this setting, mothers and fathers verbally and sometimes physically fight with one another um, quite a bit, uh, verbally in particular. Um, physical violence is uh, not uncommon as well, as an, and it can go back and forth between um, males and females. But it, it's culturally recognized that that uh, disputing between uh, mothers and fathers um, negatively affects children and that it particularly can uh, kind of be internalized emotionally for them. And then there's kind of two components of direct care um, that Bonogo men and women would talk about that some fathers did taking care of sick children um, and kind of attending to the social education of, of young children. Um, but this is not a particularly valued component of what fathers do in this setting, and very few of the fathers do very much of it. Okay? So when we look at how Bonongo fathering relates to child health, uh, what we see is that men who are better uh, provisioners tend to have children who um, are in better energetic condition and have uh, better kind of growth markers. But what's interesting about this is that the best predictor of children's growth and energetic condition in this energetically kind of s stressful um, and pathogen dense environment is father's direct caregiving scores. So there's not very many fathers who actually do all that much direct caregiving and it's not culturally valued, but it's the, it's the behavior by fathers that's most predictive of children's health and well-being. Um, so we're trying, kind of our future work is really interested in trying to suss out um, what, uh, what pathways uh, that might be occurring through as well as whether 
fathers who are doing direct care, whether maybe there are correlates um, within the community, and it's not necessarily direct caregiving by fathers that's having this beneficial effect, but maybe the way direct fathers who do direct care are kind of cultivating um, supporter relationships within the community. But when we look at um, how much mothers and fathers are perceived to fight with one another within the community, what we see is that um, fathers who, who fight more with their wives have children who have elevated markers of psychosocial stress physiologically. Um, we also are doing um, some new work looking at um, some epigenetic profiles in the children from this community. Um, and what we see is that children who are in families where there's more mother-father conflict um, have accelerated epigenetic aging, which essentially means that they are kind of more advanced in terms of their biological age than you would predict based on their chronological age. Um, and this aligns with some research. Um, this is kind of a, pr a, a new um, way of kind of conceptualizing um, physiological aging, but this does align with some work from settings like the United States that shows that um, family con conflict can be associated with advanced epigenetic aging in kids. The reason I raise those two things kind of, or these, these kind of different perspectives on child health um, is kind of keep them in the back of your mind because I'm going to walk you through um, some of our uh, psychobiological findings for men's rankings as providers as well as uh, their rankings as, as to how much they dispute with their wives. Um, so what we see first is that Bandongo fathers um, who have higher testosterone um, are seen as better providers. So again, we think this is potentially due to the fact that fathers um, who have higher testosterone in this setting um, are also the ones who will tend to be engaging activities that raise status and, uh, and are also engaging in risk-taking behaviors. Um, if we look at oxytocin, now in, so again, if you think back to my, my very overarching perspective on what um, kind of invested fatherhood tends to be associated with biologically when you think about fathers in settings like the United States, it's usually lower testosterone, kind of more investment by fathers and higher oxytocin, um, more investment by fathers um, in specific forms like direct caregiving. Among the Bandongo, again, higher testosterone, better providing and lower oxytocin men are seen as better providers. Okay, so um, if we look at these together within the same fathers, you can probably guess um, the punchline for provisioning, which is that men who are seen as better providers, again, have higher testosterone and lower oxytocin, and the men who are seen as particularly um, low ranked in terms of providing have high oxytocin and lower um, testosterone. Now, if you look at conflict between mothers and fathers, you see the opposing pattern. Men who are seen as fighting more with their wives have higher testosterone and lower oxytocin. Men who are seen as having more cohesive and kind of less conflicted relationships with their wives have higher oxytocin and lower testosterone. And so I think what this profile on the left, um, Again, men's provisioning is related to, ch to child health in terms of um, growth and kind of energetic markers. And on the right, men who are in relationships um, that are more conflicted have children who have elevated physiological markers of psychosocial stress and accelerated epigenetic aging. And so you're getting uh, different kind of profiles of fathering and men's kind of function within families um, that maps on to different types of positive and negative child outcomes within the same community. Um, if I could kind of briefly summarize um, this kind of component of the work, um, I think it's that human males um, have a likely evolved but very flexible neuroendocrine architecture that seems to be um, responsive or, or interrelated with um, multiple modes of fatherhood. Um, and it seems, I think, to help focus men's behavioral priorities, but the way in which those uh, behavioral priorities play out or what is prioritized um, occurs within um, specific kind of social, cultural, and ecological contexts, and the biology seems to kind of map onto that to a certain degree. Um, I'm going to shift gears here and talk a little bit about um, some of the work um, that I've been doing using uh, data from uh, the, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control um, and the N. Haynes Project, which is a nationally representative um, study that's meant to get at kind of U.S. population level health. 
Um, and we're going to kind of look at the lens of men's biology as kind of partnered parents through the lens of uh, evolutionary medicine and really think about whether the, this biology has implications uh, for men's well-being. The first data I'm going to show you, um, we affectionately referred to as our dad bod paper in my lab group. Um, but we're going to talk about the way in which um, lower testosterone in the context of um, partnered fatherhood in, the se in settings like the United States might be uh, disadvantageous to uh, men's body composition and particularly their cardiovascular disease risk in the long term. And so kind of setting this up a little bit from an uh, evolutionary medicine perspective, um, what you tend to see when you look um, at societies like the Bandongo um, where there's more er energetic stress, particularly pathogen loads tend to be higher um, and uh, individuals are much more uh, highly physically active is that uh, men who have lower adiposity tend to have lower testosterone and it's because their bodies are, are energetically stressed and their uh, hypothalamic pituitary testicular axes are being down regulated to kind of um, accord with that energetic stress or perhaps their infection level. Okay? So in this kind of setting, lower testosterone, less adiposity. In settings like the United States, where we're more sedentary, we're not energetically stressed, um, and our pathogen exposure is typically low, it's the case that excess adiposity tends to be uh, related to lower testosterone. And there's a number of um, kind of physiological pathways through which this occurs. Um, adipose tissue itself um, serves, acts as an endocrine tissue. Um, and so excess adiposity will convert testosterone to a form of estrogen, which then can feed back to the brain and actually shut down or decrease activity of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. So then you get less testosterone production from the testes and you get this feedback loop where not only is the, the adipose tissue converting testosterone to estrogen, um, but because of the absence or lower levels of that testosterone, which, actually, which tends to then, um, or testosterone is catabolic to fat tissue. And so when you have less of it, there's more of your, uh, an opportunity for your body to lay down more of it. And then again, it affects this feedback loop. And so you end up getting into this cycle where as you're laying down more adiposity, um, you tend to get lower testosterone and these things feed back on one another. Um, and so this is a, a potentially a mismatch um, in, particularly, in particular, in evolutionarily relevant context, if you're a father of evolutionarily, your partner father, you transition to parenthood, your testosterone goes down, and you're in one of these kind of evolutionarily relevant contexts that are energetically stressed, that actually could be potentially beneficial because testosterone is metabolically costly, and so you're freeing up more energy to potentially invest in immune function, you're freeing up energy to potentially lay down a little bit of adipose tissue as kind of a, a stored energy for the future. But when expressed in the, con in the context of a setting like the United States, this may set men up for a kind of negative um, long-term health outcomes. And it's long been known that in societies like the United States, when men transition to marriage and fatherhood, their, their adiposity tends to go up. Um, this is usually explained or explored through the context of health behaviors. So thinking about um, how men's work hours change when they become married fathers, um, how it influences their ability to exercise, uh, their diet, um, sleep quality and stress may also play a role here uh, for many fathers. Um, what we were particularly interested in is asking whether testosterone is potentially in that pathway um, linking the Marid, marital and fatherhood status to increase adiposity. So in this large nationally representative data set, um, men who are partnered in living with kids, which is the blue bar, have significantly lower testosterone than men who have never been married and are not living with kids, the white bar on the left. Uh, men who are partnered and not living with kids are intermediate. So you see this is cross-sectional data, but it's kind of a similar pattern to what we saw in Cebu. Um, in terms of the, the Adiposity measure I'm going to show you. Um, it's a measure of um, abdominal adiposity called sagittal abdominal diameter. It's, it, it's meant to be a particularly good indicator of visceral adiposity. So the adipose tissue that's in and around your, your organs and your abdomen cavity, um, which is 
kind of the least healthy fat you can have in terms of long-term risks for things like cardiovascular disease. Um, and when your testosterone is lower, you are, your body has, a, as a male particularly, your, your body has a greater propensity to put on that visceral adipose tissue. So this seems like um, a potential place where testosterone could be a mediator. If you look, so again, men who are partnered in living with kids have lower testosterone and they also have higher sagittal abdominal diameters, so they have greater belly fat um, and probably particularly visceral adiposity. So is testosterone in the pathway? Uh, yes, it is. There is a, um, a statistically, so again, there's a, if you predict men's ad abdominal adiposity from their life history status, there's a, a significant relationship where men who are living with kids have more of it. Once you put testosterone in the pathway, that goes away. Or put testosterone in the model, that goes away. So testosterone, the difference in testosterone between those groups accounts for um, the difference in this kind of risky uh, adiposity profile. One of the overarching questions we were asking in this paper was whether some of those health behaviors I mentioned actually helped explain why partnered men living with kids might have uh, lower testosterone, so is it that they're engaging in less exercise and eating poorer diets um, and sleeping more poorly? Uh, and we did not find that in this. So when we take all of these kind of health behavior related data from NHANES um, and include them as covariates, it does not decrease the relationship between uh, men's testosterone, uh, marital status, fatherhood status, and adiposity. Uh, one of the things that I'm really interested in, it used to be the case, so say in my father's generation, uh, it used to be the case that being a, a married in particular was highly protective uh, in terms of men's health. So married men and married fathers tend to have improved health outcomes relative to single men. Um, I think there's an interesting question to be asked here as to whether men who are more my age, um, whether some of those health benefits may be diminishing as a consequence of this kind of overarching tendency for them to put on excess adiposity um, across these life history transitions, which might have uh, influences for their long-term cardiovascular disease risks. The last study I'm gonna show you is um, some work that we've done, again, using the same data set and looking at whether uh, men's testosterone um, is a risk factor for depression based um, on their life history status. And so a little bit of background here, around 10% uh, of new fathers in the United States um, report having um, depressive symptoms. My guess is that this is actually pretty underreported. Um, it's certainly understudied, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if the percentage of, of men who transition to fatherhood in the US, if many more of them actually have some depressive symptomology. Um, overall, we know that uh, from some very large studies that U.S. parents tend to have um, higher rates of depression than do childless individuals. Um, and low testosterone or lower testosterone uh, in the United States is a risk factor for depression for men. And so we wanted to uh, explore whether potentially this biological capacity to respond to fatherhood that we think it probably has adaptive origins perhaps gets pushed too far for some men their testosterone perhaps comes down too low and then that is a risk factor um, for depression in the United States or um, it could also be possible that it's context specific and that when men have low testosterone as partnered fathers in um, specific kind of socio-ecological situations um, in this case we're going to use socioeconomic status um, that that could be something that it uh, kind of exacerbates this risk of low testosterone for father or for depression. If we look at men who are not fathers, when they have, if men are lower socioeconomic status, again in this big US nationally representative data set, men who are um, less educated and have low testosterone have the highest uh, risks um, for uh, depression, mild depression um, symptomology overall. When we look at men who are fathers residing with kids, um, it's actually the, this is the opposite pattern, which is why I've circled it in red. Um, this is the opposite pattern of what I thought we would find or what I hypothesized we would find when we set out to do the study. Um, and so what you see is that men who are, are better educated and have higher socioeconomic status through that marker um, who have low testosterone 
are at greater risk for depressive symptomology. And then it flips for men who are fathers but are um, less well educated where there's a, a modest increase in depression risk for men who um, have higher testosterone, whereas uh, men who have lower testosterone and are less uh, well educated have a lower uh, risk overall. There's not a lot of work that's been done cross-culturally on this question. Uh, we find some support um, for this idea that under specific circumstances, lower testosterone might be a risk factor for depression for partnered fathers. Um, that research group, um, that I mentioned previously doing the, the longitudinal research in Michigan, um, led by um, Darby Saxby and, uh, and colleagues, um, have found that men who have higher testosterone in the early postpartum have lower depression risk, but it actually has negative implications for the well-being of their partners. So men are better off kind of in terms of their psycho-emotional well-being, but their partners um, are less well off. And if men have lower testosterone, they fare more, they form, fare more poorly, but their partners are doing slightly better. Um, we did not find similar patterns um, in some work we did in Cebu, um, looking at men's testosterone uh, and its relationship to um, depression risk, including among fathers. And then one of my uh, colleagues and friends, Ben Trumbull, um, showed that in among the Chamane uh, forager horticulturalists of Bolivia, that following some really catastrophic flooding, uh, men um, who had lower testosterone um, following that flooding were the ones who had lost the most kind of crop resources um, and an ability to kind of provide for their families and they had um, greater depressive symptomology. So kind of, again, finding that low testosterone depression link under specific socio-ecological circumstances. Um, kind of in conclusion here, I think uh, these evolutionary approaches to under thinking about men's uh, biology as partners and parents um, gives us the theoretical framing to think about how and why men's biology potentially has the capacity uh, to respond to those life history transitions and why the context of the expression of those roles is important. Um, and those kind of considerations, whether we're talking about men's health as it relates to these biological um, signals or whether we're thinking about fathers' roles in families and the way that they affect children, um, we really need to be thinking more about um, fathers' biology, health, and roles in context. And I realize I'm probably kind of preaching to the choir here about that, that type of perspective um, from, from anthropology, but there are some really large um, global interventions that are being aimed at trying to facilitate fathers' involvement in families. And I've been kind of involved in some of these conversations and have oftentimes been the kind of the lone anthropologist in the room and I've had to repeatedly kind of bring up, you're, you're tweaking one part of this larger overall system and you're not thinking about the ramifications as to how it might affect, have cascading effects on other parts of the system. So um, just kind of continuing to think about how we might use um, evolutionary perspectives to in, engage and inform some of those types of interventions. Thank you and thank you to uh, my Collaborators are generous uh, participants for many years of participation in our funding sources. Thank you uh, for such a fascinating talk. So many different things for us to think about. Um, I was just wondering, so in my, my understanding of the literature on um, uh, the, the sort of psychology and behavior of the transition to parenthood for women, for mothers, yeah. and the neuroendocrine you know, functions underlying that are, are somewhat overlapping with what you were talking about for fathers where prolactin, oxytocin um, are both implicated and then progesterone, which is, has a molecular structure very similar to testosterone, of course. But um, being the, the thing that's been most observed in rodent studies, right, where progesterone seems to be the, the, the driver of this transition, I guess it's these levels that are part of the biology of gestation that prepare the maternal brain for motherhood. So I was just curious whether you have any speculative comments about what is actually driving the neuro changes that are, you know, enacting this transition in fathers? Uh, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, do. I didn't articulate it that well. 
you know, it, it, yeah, so if, I mean, Molly, you've done work on the variation in, in women's biology across pregnancies and, and things of that nature, so you're, you know, intimately familiar with all this, but, um, you know, if women are going through pregnancy and then, you know, they have, they're able to have a vaginal birth and they're able to breastfeed or choose to breastfeed, then they're, you know, there's these suite of, of kind of physiological profiles and experiences that their bodies are going to go through, right? Um, I don't, I don't think we really know about what is causing this in fathers. Um, and so, you know, we have this work by Saxby and Edelstein with these expectant fathers in Michigan, and it seems to be the case that at least some of them are experiencing these physiological changes before their babies even arrive. That suggests to me that it's something about interactions with their pregnant partner, <laughs> you know, whether it's sensory or kind of psycho-emotional yeah. that's having enough, I mean, it all, to me, it's, it's all starting at the level of the brain, right? And then it's at, something about this kind of context and those kind of um, sensory <coughs> and psycho-emotional and social experiences are affecting the brain they're synapsing at, at the level of the hypothalamus, and then it's having this cascading effect on, on men's HPG axis, right? Um, but I don't even know if, it wouldn't surprise me whatsoever. So in Cebu, we see that men who have newborns have this dramatic drop in T, right? This really, really large drop. Um, and so maybe that started before their, their babies were born, or maybe, but maybe it didn't. And so I, I this is a long-winded answer, no, but I think, it wouldn't surprise me at all if there's cross-cultural variation in the timing of this, um, and maybe in terms of what the input is, but it, I feel like it has to have, the patterns that we see in terms of um, men having lower testosterone, um, either they're, they're declining testosterone, predicting what they're doing with their, their young kids, or these correlational findings relating men's time in proximity to their kids to lower testosterone suggests to me that it's something about that, but I don't, I don't think we know what the mechanism is, whether it's psychological, emotional, or sensory, or all of the above. Very interesting, thank you. Just following up on that, I was wondering whether you get, you see any of these effects, or I mean, maybe no one's looked at it, but, but do you see any of these effects with um, non, with other forms of dependent care? Do you get it, especially hands-on care, so if you have, you know, if you're caretaking for el for elderly dependents or, you know, have pets, that, you know, do you get any of these these similar effects in, in men who are doing hands-on caregiving but with non offspring Yeah, so there are no studies that I know of in, that look at men's testosterone in the context of doing kind of sensitive nurturing care for non-offspring. And in fact, we don't even really have, part of the reason I emphasize that the, the way we define fatherhood in the Cebu study is that men having at least one biological child. Um, you know, that's, at that age, there was very few men who had stepchildren or adopted children, but we don't even have data on um, like generally speaking, the field doesn't have data on what this looks like when men have adopted children um, or stepchildren. So if there's any grad students or interest in this, that would be a really rich um, study to do. But um, there's really good data on, or there, there are studies that have been done on uh, pet owners and oxytocin. Um, and there are there was a paper that I think was in Science a couple years ago that looked at um, when dog owners and dogs engaged in like mutual gaze and, and looked into each other's eyes, oxytocin went up in both. And then when, when they did that with like habituated wolves, um, that they didn't see that the physiological kind of response was not the same. Um, and suggests something unsurprising but cool about kind of the role that dog domestication and evolution has played in shaping the physiology of kind of both partners in that diet. But, um, so that's the, the closest that I know, or the closest that comes to this in terms of some kind of caring for a non-human, um, non-offspring. But um, there was a uh, recently, uh, Dr. Uh, Aaron Burke just recently finished her PhD with Rick Rebieskis at Yale, and she did a study of um, 
gay fathers and looked at their uh, hormone levels, which, so they would have been, um, they would have had adoptive children or children through surrogacy. Um, and it was a, I think it's an important study because it's the first study that's been done, but they didn't, it, she and, and Rick didn't really find much in the way of statistically significant results, but it was a fairly small sample size, but I think a good first step to trying to understand how these patterns play out in diverse family forms. Um, so, I mean, one of the things I find really fascinating about this is the specific emphasis on direct care. Because yeah. you seem to, so that seems to replicate really well. And then the Martin study um, with the, the Toga and not seeing this effect, right? So I'm thinking about pastoralists where I work in, and in a lot of places, because there, there are lots of other people who help to participate in, in alloparenting of babies. Um, and so fathers are often doing fairly little, yeah. right? Even talk of fathers. Yeah. Um, but they do take on more of a role sometimes when kids get into sort of early middle childhood. And they, you know, I'm thinking about the dads who often are even living with their little kids, you know, middle middle childhood kind of kids out of the cow post and are quite responsible for their health and well being at that stage. Um, and I'm just wondering, A, if you would, so you saw this decline as the kids aged in the Cebu study, right? So I'm, I guess I'm first wondering, so are there studies where people have looked for these effects on kids who are a little older? Do you think the same mechanisms would be at play, or do you think this is something that's specific to babies and only direct care? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so like Martin's study, which again compared the death hope and the hot zero. Is Brian here? I know Brian said a bunch of things, but yeah. um, I mean, so, you know, I think, you know, Brian and, and Frank Marlowe and folks have studied really extensively what hot zero fathers are doing, right? And whether it varies based on whether they consider their biological <coughs> kids or step kids and things like that. And um, the hot zero fathers do a fair amount of of holding and kind of watching over of their bi of their young biological kids, but it's still not that much, right? Which is why it's an interesting, in terms of thinking evolutionarily, I've had lots of conversations with folks over the years that kind of in this vein of, fathers don't even do that much direct caregiving. Like, why is this, um, why would that be the, the cue that they're, they're kind of keying into physiologically or biologically? Um, and so, you know, potentially, um, perhaps it was more important evolutionarily or, or more prevalent, um, but so that's one part of it. I think there seems to be something about, I think there's enough consistency that suggests, and this kind of speaks to Molly's question too, that it seems to be expressed in context where fathers do some direct caregiving and spend a fair amount of time with their young kids. Um, could it happen with older kids? Could it happen with older kids? Most of the studies that are done on this are families that have young kids, right? It's part of the limit, limitation to a certain extent. Like we see um, with the SLU study, all those men had young kids. They're all in their 20s. Um, and the, the data that I showed from the Ann Haynes study, um, that's, that's a wide range. That's men who are a wide range of ages themselves. A nationally representative study, and it doesn't. The difference between partner men living with kids having lower testosterone and single men um, or never married men who have never had kids, it is. It's not affected at all if you take the men who are living with kids and partition them into whether they're living with young kids or older kids. There's no difference there, so that's kind of the best data I can think of that starts to get at that, but. Um, you know, someone just in interviewed me for probably a New York Times or a New York Times piece that's probably coming out for Father's Day would be my guess. But they asked this the same question, and so I gave them kind of that same answer. But the things that older kids need in the way that parents, in, including fathers, interact with them is really different, yeah. right? So I don't know. I I, um, I think there's a lot of questions that are still open here about like what what the mechanism is that's causing it. Um, you know, 
when have we, oh, it's really hard to have young babies who go, no, because we've got little kids. Um, and so maybe there's something about, it's less about the actual direct caregiving, but more selection and shape physiology that in specific types of, of family systems, when families have those super demanding young infants, that fathers can kind of biologically acclimate to stay more focused on, on family demands and then it becomes less important as kids get older? I don't know, I, I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of good questions to still be asked here about what's going on with all of it. So there, there's an alternative, which is that um, while it may be useful at times for fathers to be involved in um, care for young yeah. um, small children, that um, the real payoffs are in um, shifting time, energy, and importantly, risk from a faster yeah. to a slower trajectory, yeah. and um, that the infants are just acute, and that it's dose-dependent exposure, so that you know, in the Cebu study, co-sleeping, um, they're not providing any care when they're sleeping, right? Um, uh, arguably, um, it's instead just a redundant source of information yeah. that is cueing the reallocation. And, and in that sense, I think, um, so uh, metabolic disease, cardiovascular disease, obviously a major health and economic challenge in our society today. But um, many of the principal contributors to the sex differences in morbidity and mortality are, are risk-related differences. So accidental injury and death, involvement in violence, these are you know, highly dimorphic across the sexes. And, and, and um, it seems like uh, it might be useful, and I don't know if these data are in the NHANES data set, but I think that they are, um, to look there at where you might see um, surprising correlations, such as an inverse relationship between adiposity and accidental injury, mm -hmm. right? Which um, a, a sort of commonsensical approach wouldn't necessarily incline you to, you know, that is an atheoretical sort of folk model wouldn't necessarily incline you to make an association. Um, and that the change in testosterone levels may be the mediating factor there. Um, certainly there are plenty of psychological differences. There are behavioral differences that have already been documented with regard to marital status, divorce, and I think um, most compellingly widowerhood, right? So divorce, you can, you're can back to the causal direction problem, or well, maybe that was a you know, a risk pro and aggressive guy to start with, that's why the marriage didn't last, but men who've been um, widowed, not through any action of their own, right? If, if they become more risk prone, their risk for accidental injury and death goes up. That suggests that they're responding very much to these proximate cues, um, and, and thus that uh, maybe the whole system is really primarily about risk taking and less about fathering per se. And those two are, are linked in the sense that um, provisioning, um, you know, is the, the, the vehicle through which um, the investment is taking place as so changes are, are operationalized. And that's why potentially in the Congo study, yeah. right, when the, there's a confound, right, that the same strategy that is the mate-seeking, status-seeking strategy is also the strategy through which provisioning takes place, well, now it's all jumbled up, right? And, and in the United States, Things like accidental injury are a clear way to tease those apart. I mean, whether or not a man, you know, stands on the step on the last step of the ladder that has a big yellow warning label saying this is not a step, don't step here, and they do it anyway, right? I mean, it'd be really interesting to know the relationship between that adiposity and testosterone and father. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I think those are all really good um, and valid points um, in our. You know, peer-reviewed articles and things, we, we tend to talk about this as um, the shifts in testosterone and the differences um, based on life history status as kind of reorienting behavioral priorities. And so part of that is, is reorienting um, away from things that are potentially risky. And then there's also the component of, of kind of looking for other mating opportunities and things like that. But I think it's totally 
good point. I mean, bouncing Junior on the knee might just be, you know, you know, icing on the cake in terms of where they'll yep. pay us. Yes. Okay. Hi. Um, really liked your talk and some excellent visuals in there. Um, so I'm sort of curious about uh, organ or um, animals where the dad is more just like tolerating the infants, basically. And I'm wondering, do you see a dip there? Because that might help us disentangle a little bit the origins of this mechanism and its range potential. Well, so I'm trying to think if I can think of a. Do you have a, a an animal system in mind in terms of that question? Oh, I'm just no. I was just thinking about primates. That yeah. th there's some primates where yeah, the dad is just like tolerating yeah. the kid basically, or tolerating theft, or I don't that's that from dad sort of thing. Yeah. So that's uh, that's the sort of thing I was wondering about. Um, I don't, and most of the, so most of the non-human primates where this has been studied um, are the caltrichids, yeah. where the dads are really, or, um, and other New World monkeys where the dads are actually really involved, like yeah. far more involved with direct care than human fathers uh -huh. tend to be. Um, and in some of those species you do see the same pattern, but that's not a good kind yeah, of yeah. It's a talking point for, for your question. Uh -huh. um, there's some other, there's some really cool work that um, on all of baboons that was never published. It's in a dissertation. It was one of Ryan Palamba's students um, named Mark Schur. And he did a really nice longitudinal um, study of male-female friendships among the olive okay. baboons. And he actually found that, and so those males who are, are engaging in that specific strategy, they're I'd say it probably goes beyond tolerance. Like I think they're pretty good yeah. with the young, yeah, but they do show in in Mark's study they showed that a decline in or they had lower testosterone during during those periods where they uh -huh. were kind of forming the friendships. Okay. With the the females. That's that's very interesting. Um, well, I'm very excited to see what what comes tonight. If I can ask the follow up question. Yeah. Um, are you uh, in in contact with Randy Corpus and the, um, there's the I guess there yeah. yeah? No, no, but, no. <laughs> but, but I, I think I know his his work a little bit. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, what do you think about the possibility of, um, okay, like measures of life history theory um, as an individual difference variable in humans mapping onto this, especially the, um, the the slope basically of that change. Well, we. We just published that sociosexuality is often considered kind of a component of this individual difference in is life history. Is that what history. you used? You used SOI? We, we use SOIR, but my, my, okay. it's not related to testosterone in this context. It does. So the men who are partnered fathers in Cebu, mm -hmm. when they make that transition, their sociosexuality goes down across all the, do I mean, overall and across all the domains, particularly in terms of their behavior. Mm -hmm. um, not terribly surprising, and they have lower. Um, sociosexuality than uh, men in the other categories, but it's not related to their testosterone, interestingly enough. Um, so that again is it, yeah, I, it, it's it's the it's the best data we have mm -hmm. from the, the work that I specifically am doing that's related to this question. Yeah. Um, you know, I am. I think it, Randy has started to do some work looking at like early life experiences. Yeah, shaping. that's sort of more what I was getting. At. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So I, I think that, that the idea that the circumstances you experience early in life, um, so there's, there's kind of the life history oriented like psychosocial acceleration type models. Uh -huh. um, and then there, there's a number of, of other relevant perspectives from like developmental psychology mm -hmm. um, tying into attachment um, and internal working models and um, identity theory and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so what um, we have some data, uh, or I, pu I just published a paper this year looking at um, using the, the full longitudinal data from Cebu and looking at what men do as fathers themselves when they're 26 based on their experiences with their parents when they were young. And um, hey, this kind of fits in with that overall concluding point about yeah. that I was trying to make about thinking about the, the way these things function in context. But basically, 
if men grew up when they were boys, if their fathers were not involved in, in direct child care, but they had a close relationship with them, that they're, that's basically the same type of father that they are. That's how they conceptualize themselves as fathers, and they tend to not be very involved with child care. Yeah. If men were, had fathers who were more involved with child care when they were young, and they were close to them, then they replicate that same um, kind of parenting style. If their relationship was not close, then it goes in different directions. Um, and so I think there are a number of important kind of considerations about um, early life experiences and kind of relationships with caregivers, not even necessarily just parents, that potentially help shape some of these dynamics and men's orientations to how they father, how they parent. Thanks. Yeah, I was wondering if uh, you have any uh, thoughts about the role of cortisol in really in the men's health pathway that you're talking about and whether that's related to testosterone or whether that can influence health outcomes. It certainly can influence health outcomes. Um, in in Cebu, men who have higher testosterone have higher cortisol. So we only have cortisol from one time point, but um, they're positively correlated. Pretty, uh, it's moderate, but it's it's not it's not a negative relationship. It's positive. Um, what we see in terms of the kind of um, parenting status, life history status dynamics, is that men who are Single non-fathers have higher cortisol and higher testosterone than men who are partnered fathers, um, which in some ways um, runs a little bit, uh, I think there's some important questions to be asked there. It runs a little bit counter to the idea that, that parenting is necessarily hyper stressful, right? But um, I think in the context, thinking about the, the US context, those data I was showing. Um, so, uh, as elevated cortisol is a risk factor for depression, so if we're thinking about that kind of uh, joint profile within individuals, um, so if you have, um, you know, higher uh, low socioeconomic low socioeconomic status, single non-fathers with low testosterone, those men may be particularly apt to have high cortisol, um, low, low socioeconomic status is associated with elevated cortisol on average in the US. Um, and so that could be a contributing factor there to kind of the ideology of depression risk. It's certainly well known that elevated chronic cortisol is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. I mean, really good longitudinal studies like the Whitehall 2 study have shown that um, um, pretty pretty elegant in terms of documenting the, the social circumstances in which that arise and, and the risk. So to me, that it, in some ways, it it's an individual level difference question, though, because you really need to ascertain whether individuals are chronically psychosocially stressed and they're experiencing things that we know activate the HPA, like threat, unpredictability, lack of control, um, again, those things tend to kind of coalesce at the bottom of the social hierarchy, whether you're talking about humans or non-human primates. And so I think if you're thinking about it in the context of whether some men may have low testosterone as partnered fathers, what, is, what are the other aspects of their kind of social lives in terms of those risk factors for activating the HPA in a, on a chronic level, because that could then exacerbate the risk for either of those diseases. Does that answer your question? I think I was talking a lot. Yeah, no, and so you don't think there's a particular influence of fatherhood in the sort of feedback between testosterone and cortisol? It's, you think it's sort of in the, in the um, system in other ways? Yeah, I don't, I don't think Necessary. I think it depends on the the, con the in individual context in which a man becomes a father. Um, I think there are probably varying degrees to which um, you know. Let's, if we're just assuming that a man is is living with his kids, if he's you know not residing with his kids and kind of is detached from the family in that way, um, then I I don't necessarily know that the fatherhood component is going to be. Uh, Actually, I'll back up from that. That's going into the weeds. But um, 
I don't know that there is this, like in, in the way that you would kind of set up questions about testosterone, prolactin, and oxytocin um, as kind of a potentially adaptive component of the transition of fatherhood. I don't know that I see cortisol fitting in in that, in that same way, but I do think there are aspects of being a parent that are incredibly stressful um, and uh, vary by social and ecological context, and I think that would be the predictor of whether it's a risk factor. Those individual level factors would be the key to whether it's a risk for long-term disease.